Good morning, Crossroads family. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our weekend service. We're so glad you're here today. Come on, can we just give the Lord a hand of praise? He's given us a new day, a beautiful day to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Come on, we acknowledge the King of kings and the Lord of lords who reigns forever. Come on, put those hands together, everybody. Let's go. Church, say, see our God and 
is king. Come on, you believe that? Someone shout amen. Come on, we got so much to give him thanks for today, amen. Come on, let's keep those hands going just like that, church. Yeah. It's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Come on, let's sing it together. Wandering into the night. One ain't a place to hide this weary soul. This vagabond, yeah. And I try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, yeah. This vagabond. And just when
a worthy God. Come on, you believe he's faithful. Someone shout amen. amen. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your mercies. And today we're here to sing that, Lord, for all our days, we're going to, we're going to bless you, Lord. Amen. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all me 
And Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you, the Lord, your goodness runs after us every single day. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Yeah. Church, isn't he faithful? Yeah. Hasn't he been good to us? Yeah. Lord, we bless you. So we're going to sing about the goodness again. Amen. Amen. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Church, sing. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. to his goodness today. Can we respond to his goodness, to his loving kindness today? One writer says his loving kindness is better than life. So come on, can we lift our voice to heaven and give him a praise? Give him a shout for where he's brought you from to where you are today. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We give you praise. Hallelujah. His goodness is running after me. Do you hear that? I don't know why. Why are we always running from his goodness, Pastor Paul? I don't know what's up there. I hear those, those, but that's a lot of it. It's like whether we're running, his goodness is still there. And a lot of times we want to measure his goodness by our circumstance, by our situation. It's like, that's not his goodness. That might not be good, right? But his goodness that's what we're looking at today. So I want you to take a moment, look at a neighbor and say, welcome, I'm glad you're here. And, and say this, say, God is good. God is good. If you're joining us online, welcome. Let us know you're here. Maybe put, you know, your family name and just put a God is good in the comments. We're happy you're worshiping with us. East Hartford, you may be seated. God is good. Woo! God is good. All right, y'all got some energy. God is good. I see some smiles. Even those wearing your mask, I know you're smiling under there. We got to show some teeth every once in a while. So excited to be here. Woo. Aren't you just happy today? Aren't you happy today? Come on. Aren't you a little happy today? Come on. Come on. You're killing me. Aren't you just a little happy today? I'm telling you, when you sit in God's goodness, you find this joy. And people will be like, man, look at your situation. Why are you smiling? And you're like, oh, I know Jesus. It's good. I know where my eternity's at. Amen. I'm excited to be here. My name is Sterling. I'm the East Hartford Campus Pastor. And I want to say, if you're a first-time visitor and you're here, this is your last time we're going to call you a visitor. This is your home. So if we can give them a hand clap. Excited that you're here today worshiping with us. Excited to be with you. Uh, you know, you, there's multiple ways you can find connection here. We have this first little step to try to help. You can text 80123-CONNECTION. And you can fill out information. We have a connection card in front of you. And if that's not enough, we put connection point out in the atrium because we want us to find connection. That looks so many different ways. It's serving, small group. Uh, there's so many things to do this season that just being a part serving and finding ways to be connected. And so do what you got to do to find that connection. If you're like, man, I'm not happy right now. When you put yourself around people who love Jesus and are smiling, it just starts rubbing off a little bit. And so just, yeah, there we go. Just make it happen. And so we have a couple of great things coming up that I'm excited about. One, is the angel tree. Uh, as you come in, y'all saw a Christmas tree, those who were here in person, and you said, 
what in the world? We haven't had Thanksgiving. What's happening? So we haven't put the Christmas music on yet. It is coming. But we got the tree out there. And so what Angel Tree is, it's for um, children whose parents are incarcerated to give them a love this season, Christmas gifts. And so last night, it was awesome. We were able, right now they're still contacting parents, getting what the kids like, boys and girls and the toys. And we put them out and the tree got swarmed and boom, they were gone. And we're like, what is happening? So now we have more out there this morning. And so we know that those are going to be going quick. And so when you go out and you see them gone, come and check next week. Check later. We'll have more children up there as parents are reaching out. And then on the 20th, everyone who's online or if you're here in person, you can go online and you can pick a child who's online. So those are separate kids. Uh, and we're given the option for everyone to be a part and love on people this season. And another great, exciting thing we're doing is, again, we're doing our, our food drive where we're able to love on families. I think last year we had over 60 families that we gave Thanksgiving meals to. This year, I think we're shooting for a, a hundred. Isn't that awesome? And you know why that happens? Because of you. It's the giving. It's the heart of giving. It's saying, hey, so this week when you're shopping, just throw some extra things in there. And you can go online. You can go to Connection Point. We have a card that tells if you're saying, what items do we specifically need? They'll take anything. Uh, but if you go look, there's specific Thanksgiving items that they're in need of. And so uh, next weekend is the pickup. So if you're here in person, you pull up uh, Saturday or Sunday, you leave the food right there. I did catch someone today who left food and we found it. We went and picked it up th today. So if you did that, we'll, we'll catch it. But bring it, put food there, and we'll pick it up. Uh, if you're online, you can come by at any point when, when the church is open. That can be the weekend, the weekdays, same with you guys. But this season, uh, let's continue to give. Amen. Let's be givers. Let's be people. I know sometimes we say, well, I'll look at what I have, and we focus on that, and that's great. Uh, but there's this thing about when we give, the focus is kind of off of us. And so as our ushers come forward, just to hit on that, that heart of giving, I'll tell you a little bit. Some of you have heard this, but for me, where my giving came from and I, my discipleship in that area was my grandmother, Irma Key. That was her name, Irma and so they always had a garden. They did not have much. Uh, we lived on a, a farm. And they just always were doing a garden. And my grandma, she would get bags of food. And she'd get, come on, Sterling. And we'd get in the car. And she'd go to folks in town who were in need. And then she was a giver. She tithed. And so I saw that growing up. And it was something that, you know, it was a blessing for me. It wasn't me later having to try to figure out how to give. I just quickly, I started working and I knew like, hey, I gotta give my 10%. I gotta give my tithe to the Lord. He's given to me. And so I encourage, maybe this is your first time giving. It's okay. You can give a little. God's looking at your heart. That's what he's looking at. Give joyfully. That's what the Lord cares about. Give joyfully. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, we take a moment to look at our heart. What that means is our motive, our character, our integrity behind what we're doing. And, and God, we want it to be good. We want it to be pure. And so, Lord, as we give today, we give with a joyful heart. God, thank you that we get to be a part of the big picture of, of loving people, reaching people for eternity, for your kingdom. Today, we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's continue to worship, church. Oh 
shout amen because he goes before us he's around us he's behind us he's everywhere and he will lead us amen 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 well thank you for worshiping with us church you may be seated to our East Hartford campus. I want to welcome today our East Windsor campus. It's great to have you here with us and everybody who's with us online. Um, listen, we want to take a, a moment and pause. You just saw that video and say a huge thank you to everyone here who is a veteran or maybe someone in your family is a veteran. This Thursday is Veterans Day. Yeah, that's appropriate. Let's celebrate them. You know, I know I've had family members in, in my family that have served, and uh, many have served at great cost to person. Uh, there are those of us who have family members who have, have served at the highest cost, even in giving their own life, uh, so that we can have some of the freedom, some of the privileges that we have today. And I think it's always, always appropriate to honor 
uh, those who serve us in those kinds of ways. So we wanted to pause and say a huge thank you uh, to you on that. And, and I would encourage you this, this Veterans Day, if you have any opportunities to celebrate those around you uh, in those fields, take that opportunity and do it uh, out of the love of Christ. Amen? Amen. Listen, if you have your Bibles with you today, I want to ask you to take them, even if you don't normally take them, and open to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, uh, we're going to look at a, a few different verses there, and, and they'll throw it up on the screen, you'll see one or two verses at a time, but you may want to go back and forth a little bit as we walk through that. And then also, while you're turning there, and I know this is going to be tough because we're, we're using multiple hands here now. Um, as you're walking through our service today, as we get to the end of our service, this weekend uh, is one of the weekends where we're celebrating communion together. And so you should have some communion elements. Uh, and, and I want to ask you as we walk through this, just kind of as a reminder, because we're going to be referencing some things in here, uh, to take your communion and put it in your hands. Just normally you have a spot where you put it, Right? Uh, but I want to ask you today to take it and put, put them in your hands um, as, as just a reminder because uh, we're going to be going back and forth in the reference side of what we're doing uh, to that. Uh, you'll find that as we get to the end, we're going to reference 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, uh, where Paul the Apostle kind of gives us some instructions in all of this, and he talks about the bread, and he talks about the wine, and, and, and in the end of it all, he says that Jesus, when instituting this, all said, do this in remembrance of me. Say, in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. And so uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about that, in remembrance of me side of things, and, and what does all of that mean uh, we're going to start in a little bit of a different place, but you'll see how this all ties together. And again, if, if you can, if you're comfortable, just kind of keep that in your hands. Uh, don't fiddle too much. I know when I was a kid, uh, when I was much younger, I would take this and I would fiddle too much, and invariably I would work a hole into it. That is not a good thing. I mean, it's not, it's not like a sacrilegious thing or something. It's just, it's going to make a mess. So don't, don't do that. It'll be good. Matthew 16, uh, we're going to begin reading with verse number 13, and I'm going to read about five verses here, and then, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. It says this, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, well, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others say you're Jeremiah, or maybe one of the prophets. Verse 15, he, Jesus, said to them, okay, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, well, you're the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Amen. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father who is in heaven, he's the one that revealed that to you. And then he goes on with verse number 18, he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I am going to build my, what? Church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, uh, two questions today, two questions I, I want us all to consider. They're very similar questions but also very different. Question number one, who is Jesus Christ? Question number two, very similar, but also very different. Who is Jesus Christ to you? When Jesus humbled himself by stepping out of heaven and, and, and coming to this planet and walking amongst all of mankind, he had at least two main revelation objectives, two things that he wanted to reveal to all of mankind. Number one, first, he wanted to reveal himself as God who held the power to restore our relationship to him. Second, he wanted to reveal himself as God, the one who held the power to restore our relationships 
with one another. Communion with him and communion with one another. Jesus kind of here was testing his success in regards to this revelation when he led his disciples to a retreat area at a beautiful resort village in northern Galilee, there under the shadow of Mount Hermon. Jesus guides the disciples towards this crucial issue of their understanding of his real identity. Who is Jesus? Matthew 16, 15, he said to them, who do you say that I am? This is a pivotal question that faces everyone, even today. It's the pivotal question that faces every group, every congregation, every community of believers. And we live our lives differently based on how we define the answer to that question. Who do you, Jesus says, say that I am? Who do you today, if he were here and asking you, who do you say that I am? It's interesting to me that the disciples, when first asked the question, had to kind of pause and reflect. He asked it in a more general way, who do do men say that I am? And they had to pause to think about it. Jesus had spent months drilling into them the basic principles of the kingdom. He had taught them by words and by deeds, things that he said and things that he did. He had taught them with the Beatitudes, He had taught them through parables and stories in ways that would make it easier for them to understand. He had taught them through signs and wonders. That is, he had done things that no human could do, making it very obvious that he was a little bit different. They had seen with their own eyes. They had heard with their own ears that God and his kingdom were now among them. And they knew that the opinion of the crowds around them was very varied about what the answer was gonna be. And so in Matthew 16, verse 13, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And in verse 14, they say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It's it's kind of like they believed in some kind of weird kind of reincarnation thing and he was a part of it, right? But when Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter could almost hear himself saying the words, well, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. That name Christ there literally means the anointed one. That's the definition of the name. The name, uh, it it comes from, uh, it was normally used in relation to two different Old Testament offices. There was the anointed high priest and there was the anointed king. That's how the name was normally used in in the olden days. And and the, the people of God who were there that day, they had been looking literally for the anointed one. They, they had been looking for this high priest, this king who was going to be the one who would have the power to absolve the sins of mankind. And now finally he had come. The beautiful announcement is first heard uh, from the lips of an angel. You probably remember it, reading it before in Matthew one twenty one. The angel says, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus and he will save people from their sins. That's the way the angel said it. Here's the way Peter said it. To me, you are the Christ, the anointed one. My high priest, the king, you are the anointed one. You are the son of the living God. When people fully recognize that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the anointed one, that Jesus is the king. When people fully recognize him in their lives, it's in that moment that it opens up the door to transformation in their lives. It underscores his saving work. It underscores his deity. It underscores his lordship in our lives. He is Lord, he is king. 
Now, here, here's the unfortunate truth. Uh, many times today, and this is, this is kind of a result, I think, of the church and how we present things today, we get confused about who Jesus is. Isn't it true that sometimes, maybe all of us at times, we don't think of Jesus in those terms. We think of Jesus as this really nice person who gives us a magical ticket to heaven. He's the one who forgives me of my sins and gives me this ticket to heaven. And that's true and that's very important. But the only reason he can do that is he is Lord. He is king. And through him, the broken relationship with God can be mended and sin can be forgiven forever. But only because he is Lord. That's one of the objective relationships or the the revelation objectives of Jesus. To reveal himself as the Christ, the God who came near to us, the one who holds the power to restore our relationship with God. Why? Because he is Lord. And when we lift the bread and the cup today, I will do so in remembrance of him. He is the Lord of my life. He is my king. He is the anointed high priest. Not me, him. There was another revelation objective that Jesus had. He wanted to reveal himself as God who held the power to restore our, our communion with him, but also he wanted to, restore, to, to reveal himself as God who holds the power to restore our communion with one another. You see, through us together, through his disciples in this first meeting uh, where, where communion was first instituted, his message was eventually going to be extended. And a new community was eventually going to be built. And so for the first time, here in this passage, he announces, this passage that we read just a moment ago, he announces, not, not only through Peter's answer about who he is, but he, he goes on and he extends that, and he announces that a part of who he is is, is God who is going to build this church. This new community that's going to prevail even against the the forces of hell. Let me me show you the connection. Uh, We we get confused about church. We think of it as a building and and all kinds of other things, right? Uh, But Jesus' connection to the church is so deep and so intimate. And any time it's talked about in the New Testament, the the depths are amazing. Let me give you one illustration. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 5, here... Uh, the, the normal thought is to talk about uh, relationships, and, and the verse that I'm going to read is focusing on husbands and wives, but I want you to notice the truth that we learn in this verse about Jesus and the church and the connection that's there. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, I want us to see something here. It says this, husbands love your wives, and there's the main focus on what we normally focus on. Husbands love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and what? Gave himself for her. Who's the her? The church. Don't miss this important point. Let me say it to you differently. God so loved the world that he gave his son. The son so loved the church that he gave his life for her the church. And as we partake of communion today, it is very easy for us to focus on Christ, the redeemer of our individual lives. And that is oh so appropriate. But we must not forget that he is the Christ who gave his life, not just for the individual, but he gave his life for the church, for this new community that would be developed. And I I submit to you that we cannot say we love Christ without having a great and profound love also for his church, his community. 
Theologian Gilbert Belzikian many years ago commented on this and he said this. He said, the hermit, you understand what a hermit is? Hermit is somebody who lives on their own. The hermit who cultivates spiritual reality in the remote solitude of a cave, seems like there's a lot of people trying to do that today. The hermit who cultivates spirituality in the remote solitude of a cave does not really love Christ. Why? Because they are separating themselves from the community that Christ is trying to develop. He goes on and says, the evangelist who thinks he saves and heals people without pressing them to join a local body does not really love Christ. A passive church attendee does not really love Christ. A racist, sexist Christian that separates others from themselves does not really love Christ. Christians who allow churches to wallow in mediocrity do not really love Christ. Can you understand why? Because Jesus gave his life for the church that the church might be built and established and represent him. And if we are going to allow ourselves to be separate from the church and allow churches themselves to wallow in mediocrity, then we don't have the same heart that he has. The person who really loves Christ is driven by a compelling passion for the church because she, the church, is his, Christ's, passion. He gave his life for her. Some today desire to gather together to kind of do their own thing, right? But we don't gather together for individual purposes. We gather together for corporate worship. We lift our voices together in worship to God. And when we do that, we're not just speaking to God. The scripture says when we are together and we lift our voices to God, we're also speaking to one another. We're encouraging one another. We're pushing one another forward. We're lifting each other out of the craziness of the life that is around us and all the troubles that we're going through. When we lift our voices in praise, we edify one another. When we do it alone, we worship God. When we do it together, we worship God and we build each other. We're encouraging one another. I know we talk a lot about having a personal relationship with Christ and that is first and foremost And that's very important. But the pursuit of community is the ultimate goal that that the Bible gives to us. It's individuals who first have a personal relationship with God coming together to become one in him. We are to be united around the mission of the cross of Jesus Christ. We are to be one people in community and we're to regularly come together in worship to proclaim to the world around us the redeeming Christ who makes us one. And as we take communion today, we are called to remembrance. I want to call us to remember Christ, our Lord and Savior, not just someone who's given us a magical ticket to heaven, but the Lord of our lives. And I also want to call you to remember Christ who came to build his church, who wants you and I to find our place within his community, loving and supporting one another. And I ask all of us today to examine ourselves. Are you here to do an individual thing? Are you here for your own benefit or or are you here to please him and to find your place within the body of believers? What is your attitude towards the community of faith? Do you join your voice in worship alongside of others when the worship leader calls you to? Have you taken the time to connect in the community that's here with a small group of believers that you you can just kind of do life together so that you can grow with them and encourage them or are you just kind of walking through life on your own? 
Have you found a place where you can get involved and serve the body and help build the body and help encourage the body so that this would not be some mundane group of people that gather together, but we could be strong and vibrant the way God has called us to be? Can I say this just for a moment? That we wonder why the church has no strength in our world today. Is it possible that we have made the church out to be a place where people go for a moment and retreat to their home? and we have not taken the time to pour our lives into this body in a way where we would represent what God has really called us to be. I can tell you that Jesus' attitude is an attitude of unity. Let me take just a moment before we conclude our message and go back to the beginning. It's interesting, almost any message that we preach we can take it back to the very beginning, the first chapters of Genesis, and there's so much illustration to, to expound on, to, to, to bring meaning to it. But, but listen to this, this is very important. In the beginning, the Bible tells us that God created mankind in his own image. The scripture says this though, listen, Genesis 2.18, and the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. By himself, Man was non-community. He was less than the image of God. He was created to be in the image of God, but by himself, it wasn't good. It wasn't fully the image of God. And so God says, I will make a helper comparable to him. Here's what that looks like, Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Mankind wasn't created to be independent. Independence is a step down. Unity together in God's image is the highest design that we have. But the complete story of the Bible says that sin destroyed that unity. Sin separated humans from God and sin separated humans from one another. And so Adam and Eve broke relationship with God and they discovered that their own relationship had also broken as well. And now in shame, they began to hide their differences from one another. And it wasn't long until man quit working together and started working for themselves. They sought to, to bring something good for their own selves. That's what brought about the first murder. Cain and Abel. Two brothers who should love one another and be working to make one another better. But then they got to this place where they were offering an, an, an offering to God and they wanted my offering to God needs to be better than your offering to God. And so, so my individual importance is more important than us together. And since mine is more important, you must forfeit your life. They weren't building community with God. Mankind was putting itself at the center instead of God and his will. Can you see how that happens in our lives today? If you were to examine your own life, can you see times in your life today where that's what you do, that's what I do? We, we, we put ourselves forward instead of the community. But Jesus came to restore community. He came to restore oneness. John chapter 17, verse 11, Jesus is talking here and he's praying. He says, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world and I come to you, holy father, keep through your name those who you have given me that they may be what? One as we are one. Just a few verses later in that same chapter, John 17, 21, listen to the oneness that's built all through these verses. That they also may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. Again, many Christians today think that having a personal relationship with God through Christ is all that there is to Christianity. Just praying a prayer of faith so that I'm good. Are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. I'm good. Right? But that, that's not right. 
That's not the fullness of what God's called us to. There is another dimension to the cross. Jesus didn't come just so people would have a savior. He came that people would be restored to oneness. Oneness with him and oneness with one another. There's a unity in the body, the church. Now our society around us today is trying to find every difference and every irritation point and poke the bear to stimulate the differences to create separation. But Jesus would say, in my church, in my church, that's not what we do. In my church, we strive for unity. And everything that seeks to separate us, we put that outside and we see each other as image bearers of Christ and we come together. Ephesians 2 verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off, and this is the point, our society today wants to illustrate the fact that we once were separated from one another. We are separated from one another. We, we have done things to harm one another. We have done things that create differences in one another, whether it's socioeconomic or, or, or this manufactured thing called race or, or, or our preferences around this or that or how we were brought up you know, from a different culture or whatever it is, our culture wants to accentuate those things and call us to just focus on the differences. Jesus says, but now, or Ephesians says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Christ that again makes us one family. Brothers and sisters, same Father, same Creator God who, who, who works all this in one. And then just a couple of verses later, verse 16, Ephesians goes on to say, he died that we might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore, thereby putting to death the enmity. And the enmity is that thing that stands between us and separates us. That's what Jesus wants us to remember. That's what communion is all about. Communion is all about oneness. Oneness with God and oneness with each other that all comes through Jesus Christ. And the scripture challenges us that as we approach communion together, that we are to examine ourselves and understand where we are in fitting into all of that. In fact, Scripture tells us it's an important thing to do. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29, it says, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment on themselves, not discerning the Lord's body, saying, you need to be right before God before celebrating. And so today, I wanna ask you to do that with me. Let's examine ourselves for a moment. Where are you today? Where are you today in relation to recognizing the Christ as the Lord of your life? Is he the Lord of your life? Have you come to him, recognized your sins, and asked for forgiveness? Even in this moment, right now, wherever you're at, here in our East Hartford campus, in our East Windsor campus, at home, online, watching, in this moment, would you examine your heart and examine your lives? And if there is some sin that's in you that is separating you from God, in this moment, would you come to him and ask him for forgiveness? And in the same moment, would you ask yourself this question? Is he the Christ in your life? Is he the anointed one? Is he the king do you see him as someone who's just kind of given you a magical ticket that, that promises eternity one day? Or he, is he the Lord of all your life? Is he the Lord of your decisions? Is he the Lord of the way you are living your life? Where are you at in relation to recognizing the Christ as the one who came to restore us to oneness? Are you a part of the church, the body of Christ? Are you a part of this church, this expression of the local body? We are to remember Christ. He humbled himself. He suffered 
so that others might live. He maintains a place of oneness even when there's great personal sacrifice to him and he calls us to that same oneness. He calls us to that place alongside of one another to work together, to pray together, to sing together, to be about the Lord's business together. And to do that, according to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, to do that until he comes again. Lord, even so now, come quickly. This bread, he said, is the body which is broken for you. Every time we eat it, he says, do this in remembrance of me. The cup is the new covenant in his blood. And as we take it, he says, do this in remembrance of me. That's the charge that he gives us. To let communion time be a reminder that he is the Christ. He is the Lord of our lives, our personal savior. And that he has given his life for us so that we can be one with one another. As we take the bread today and the cup today, may his name be glorified in our lives together. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we approach the end of another one of our worship times with you. And one more time, I want to pause and thank you for your word that leads us and guides us into all truth. Your word is filled, filled with understanding and wisdom about who you are, how you have designed us, how you have created us. And I thank you that we can dive deeply into it and understand you more through that. Today, we come together to remember you, to remember your sacrifice, and to remember why you have made that sacrifice for us. And we worship you together. Amen. We've been talking about Different, some of the different aspects of communion. One of them is who Jesus is in relation to making us one. And so I've invited uh, two of our campus pastors here uh, to join me, Pastor Luke, who's our online campus pastor, Pastor Sterling, who is our East Hartford campus pastor. Uh, they're here just kind of as a visual symbol that we are not alone in this. We are one with one another. And so they're gonna work with us together as we celebrate today. I'm going to ask Pastor Luke if he would begin in leading us forward. Crossroads, we're going to read this portion of a letter from Paul. The thing that astounds me about this communion meal is that every Christian ever is a link together. We have celebrated with each other, with every other Christian. And it says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance, would you join me as I pray? Lord Jesus, thank you that you came that we could have relationship with you, that we could know you and be connected with you. God, thank you that you were willing to put yourself through all that it meant to, to enter into our space. God, that we could be connected with you. Thank you that we look forward to when we celebrate this with you in heaven. God, we are anticipating the day that we are together. And Jesus, we thank you for it in your name. Amen. Would you join me? Thank you, Jesus. The same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In remembrance of me, 
And so if you can take a moment as we pray, can you reflect and remember what Jesus has done? We thank you, Lord. Jesus, that you came. God, you sent your only begotten son so we can have eternal life until Jesus returns. So I thank you that our sins are washed away. They're clean as far as the east is to the west. Today, Lord, we remember what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If we can drink together. All of this is a celebration of our oneness with him and our oneness with one another. I wanna ask you for just a second, take a look around you today. Look at the people who are around you. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. One family. We've been called to love one another. We're gonna end our service the way we end all of our services. In just a moment, our worship team is gonna lead us in one last song. Before they do, I'm gonna ask some of our leaders to come down here to the front to be ready to pray with individuals. One of the things that the Bible has told us to do, Jesus said, uh, called us to do, is, is to love one another by reaching out to him together. There's something different about that connection. We can reach out to him alone, but there's something different when we gather together in this way. And he has said, that when there's a need that's in our life, whatever that need is, that we are to call on the leaders of the church, ask them to pray with us, ask them to pray for us. And so we wanna do that. We wanna follow the pattern that's there. And so I wanna ask you, before you leave today, if there's a need that's in your life, maybe it's a need that's in the life of somebody who's near you, that you love and that you care about, and it's above your ability to solve, I wanna encourage you to pause for just a moment today. Come down here to an altar, bend your knee, reach out to God, maybe ask one of the leaders here to pray with you, pray for you when we go as the worship team leads us. The altars are open for people to come. The worship team's gonna lead us. God bless you as you come. Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus Jesus Everybody say Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning, from beginning to the end, it will always be told. the world around us would see you at the center of our lives and at the center of this community. And when they see you, that you would be lifted up in their eyes. Father, as we leave this place, we go out into a world that is lost and separated from you. Help us to be the salt and the light that you have called us to be. Help us to share our own stories of how you've transformed our lives with the people around us and help us to invite people around us to come to a place like this where they can hear your word preached and maybe even see their eternities changed as they come to know you as their personal savior. We give you all the glory for you alone are worthy. And everybody said, amen. amen.
at Crossroads. Thanks so much for being with us for this weekend service. We are blessed to be with you as we pursue God together. If you're ready to continue on in that journey, or maybe you're ready to take the very first steps of following God, we would love for you to text the word BEGIN to 80123 so that we can follow up with you and talk more with you about what to do next. God bless. We'll see you soon.